New numbers from the CDC show a surge of sexually transmitted infections. It's getting scary out there. Sexually transmitted infections are at an all time high. Half of all infections are resistant to at least one antibiotic. There are dozens of infections that can be spread by sex or sexual contact, but we're talking about a surge in a handful of well-known bugs. That's gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. Okay, look at this. Over the past decade, chlamydia cases are up 16%. Gonorrhea cases more than doubled. Syphilis cases more than tripled. Bumps, abnormal discharge, or burning when you pee. We are here to talk about how to protect yourself and how to navigate the tricky questions. I thought I would tell you what I did when a partner tested positive for chlamydia. Hello, whoever is watching this video. My name is Loreen. Like other 45 million Americans, I have herpes. Surprise, mother Okay, Vitals World, there's no reason to keep this a big secret. More than half of Americans will have an STI in their lifetime. STI stands for sexually transmitted infection. You may also hear STD, sexually transmitted disease, and they mean the same exact thing. Okay, Dr. Wendy, board certified OBGYN, we have some things to learn today. So first I wanna go through what are some signs and symptoms of different STIs? So, you know, we kind of put gonorrhea and chlamydia together because they are like friends. Um, they sometimes travel together. And so gonorrhea is often asymptomatic, as is chlamydia. The two can present as discharge, especially for people with penises. You may see some discharge, but sometimes they don't even see, see, see discharge. And though, and people with vaginas often don't notice a change in their discharge. So take home there is, it's often asymptomatic. Is there any swelling, burning, anything? You know, uh, Snoop Dogg said uh, that, you know, he felt like he was gonna get burnt while he was up in it. And I think, you know, that was cool. It was some public health knowledge, but I also feel like a lot of people think that they're gonna burn or swell, and often people don't. You definitely can have irritation, burning, or swelling, but the problem is there's a lot of overlap with those symptoms. A person can have no you know, sexually transmitted infection at all and notice burning or swelling. Um, and so gonorrhea and chlamydia can do that, but it also often doesn't. So sometimes something ain't right, but you don't know if something ain't all the way right. So aside from regular screening, when should you be going to the doctor? When is it like, yes, I need to go to the doctor now? The safest answer to that question is just go. Just go. Um, because the problem with trying to know exactly what's happening is that you don't always know. You don't know if it's just a little not right or a lot not right. Here's a super important point. If you have one of these infections, you can spread them, even if you don't have any kind of symptoms. In fact, doctors and nurses call chlamydia the silent infection because most patients have no symptoms. That's also true for the majority of women with gonorrhea. I think anyone who is sexually active should be screened. And I, I broaden that out to even people who are in long-term or monogamous relationships. Because again, I have never called somebody who had a positive infection and said, hey, you have this. And they said, oh, I knew that. They told me that, or oh, I had a feeling. Like that is always a surprise. To be totally clear, all these infections we're talking about are treatable with antibiotics. So what are the risks for some of these illnesses if they go untreated? Chlamydia and gonorrhea can kind of do a number on your pelvis. So it can cause something called pelvic inflammatory disease, which is a really bad infection inside of the abdomen, um, causing severe pain, nausea, vomiting, that kind of thing. But the thing is, those infections can actually ascend or move up into the abdomen and not cause those severe symptoms. Well, I've seen people who may or maybe are going for, um, you know, treatment for infertility or something, and we go and take a look in their pelvis and we see all of this scar tissue and all of this, uh, you know, evidence of previous infection. And we say, hey, have you ever had an infection with like chlamydia? Oh yeah, back in college. Come to find out it got, it actually did get into their pelvis and it can cause scarring. It can cause the tubes to be um, infected and uh, not work as well when it comes time for pregnancy. Syphilis can be really dangerous. Uh, disseminated or tertiary syphilis can, you know, affect your ability to move and walk. I mean, this can be bad and it's super treatable. Like that one, you take some penicillin and you're, you're good, you're good to go. What's scary is that an increasing number of these infections are resistant to some of the treatments that are out there today. This key point there is to make sure if you are infected by something, whether it's syphilis or even gonorrhea or chlamydia, you go back in to be tested again at the appropriate interval to make sure that it's gone. 
Now, don't think we forgot about herpes. Unlike the other infections we've been talking about, herpes is caused by a virus and it is not curable. Although there is a medication that can make flare ups shorter and less frequent. At least one in eight Americans aged 15 to 49 have genital herpes. And contrary to popular opinion, getting herpes or getting any of these infections does not have to end your sex life. I hear way too many stories from way too many people who thought they were going to disclose to a partner and be met with a rejection, but actually that hasn't happened. I was experiencing a very obvious situation on my genital area. I just laid on the table and my doctor looked at my genital area and said, oh, it's herpes. And there was no sort of, you know, teaser. There was no sugar coating. There was no support. It was just straight to diagnosis medical word. And I heard, of course, the medical word, but also I heard the stigma. And she might have said helpful things after that, but I think I blocked every information, incoming information after that. I just remember that her looks were kind of accusatory. Did you feel like life as you know it was over? Like your sex life was over? How did you feel? First of all, I couldn't believe that I had genital herpes because all I knew about genital herpes or incurable STIs was that you had to be promiscuous to contract one or you had to be irresponsible and I didn't really identify with any of those behaviors. Um, so I did withdraw from the dating scene, but a lot of what I did or a lot of what I, how I felt was very unconscious. I didn't necessarily choose to withdraw from the dating scene, but I felt like I couldn't, you know, be sexually active um, with people and not tell them about my diagnosis, but telling them about my diagnosis was just too daunting. So how did you get from that point where like your diagnosis is like this bomb to then talking about it publicly, having your channel, what changed that perspective? I think what happened is that with a little bit of education, a lot of information and realizing that the heavier part of having an incurable STI such as genital herpes was the psychological toll that it was taking on me. I felt like if I had been living in this situation for, you know, over two years, many people must be living the same situation. And I felt like it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair for us. If it was nothing to, to be ashamed of, then it was certainly nothing to hide. Now, I don't want you to go around terrified. That is not our goal here. For most of us, having a sex life is a part of being a healthy adult. But to protect yourself and protect others, you have to communicate. And this, the importance of communicating uh, around safer sex and sexual health is not just important in the case of genital herpes, it's important with all STIs, knowing that all STIs are either manageable, curable, or treatable. So in your experience, how do you tell partners? When do you tell partners? I would say uh, be as you know succinct as you can, just saying a few years ago or perhaps a few months ago, I tested positive for genital herpes. Um, and definitely, you know, mind your posture, mind your voice, mind your, because what you say matters, but how you say it also uh, communicates a lot. And so definitely ask also this, you know, potential partner, when was the last time that they tested for STIs? Have they ever contracted an STI? And, you know, how, how, how what have they learned from it? And what are their preferences in terms of um, safer sex? And just treat it as a discussion that can just lead to a stronger connection between you two. These diseases have been around for a long time. So we have to ask, why has it gotten so bad now? What happened in the pandemic, I think, is that we weren't able to get people into care. And so people who potentially um, either had mild symptoms and wanted to be checked, couldn't get in, or more frequently had no symptoms whatsoever. These are the people that we often catch at our well person visits or your annual physical exam. They weren't able to access the healthcare system. Now, it's important to say that this is not all about the pandemic. National funding for STI prevention is down more than 40% since 2003. That means fewer clinics, fewer places to test, and look what happened to the rate of syphilis over that same time. At an all-time record low right at the beginning of the 2000s in STI rates in the United States. And that record low that we had in the 2000s was directly related to the amount of federal funding that was spent after and, and sort of 
as a result of the AIDS crisis. A few decades ago, almost 80% of young people, and when I say young people, that's people under the age of 25, were endorsing that they use condoms most of the time for their, their sexual intercourse. And that number has decreased to 50% in the most recent data. That's a significant decline and speaks to a number of issues, one of which I think that is super important is the state of sex education in this country. Let's get back to the basics for a minute. Now, every STI is a little different, but for the most part, you can spread an STI through any close, intimate contact. It doesn't matter if you stop before there's an ejaculation. It does not require intercourse. So how do you stay safe? Well, latex condoms are very effective at stopping STIs. And if you are allergic to latex like me, now there are condoms made of thin plastic or synthetic rubber. Also, the fewer partners you have, the lower the odds of infection. But avoiding sex completely is the only method that's 100% foolproof. So if you do want a healthy sex life, use condoms. Okay, time for a touchy subject. Just because you are in a monogamous relationship or you think you are, doesn't mean that you are STI free. You can't always be sure without getting tested. So, okay, so I'm your patient. I'm in, my, I'm in your office and I say, my man, my man, my man, I'm in a monogamous relationship and I don't need screening. What do you say? I, I say, okay, it is your choice. I said, but I'll tell you, it, it, there's something great about knowing that I was negative on this day with this, you know, of, with these tests. I'm certainly not here to, you know, make decisions for people or to bully or push people into decisions. But as long as they understand the information that I'm presenting to them, then, you know, if they express that understanding, then that's all I can do. Now, if you're worrying about cost, the news is mostly good. Most private insurance is required to cover testing for gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia, and HIV. And it's often free without even a copay. If you still need help, Planned Parenthood and other organizations have low cost or free options. You can check out the links in our description to learn more. And what about privacy? Is someone going to see you sneaking into the free clinic? Now, I think you should hold your head up high. Anybody that has a problem with me getting tested is not somebody I want to be with, but I feel you. Younger people, particularly those under the age of 18, may have confidentiality concerns about coming into a provider and saying, I'm having sex, I need to be tested. Am I going to tell their parent? Am I going to tell their um I had one patient ask if I was going to call the police if they endorsed that they had sex. And I'm not going to lie, there can be privacy issues. If you're on your parents' insurance, STI testing might show up on paperwork that the company may send out. But I really want to urge everyone, don't treat this like a deep, dark secret. Sexual health is a part of health, period. I mean, you go in to get your blood pressure checked and you're not like, oh my God, you're going to check my blood pressure? You know, you get your cholesterol checked and it's not like, oh my God, now my cholesterol. Yes, it's associated with sex, but also it's making sure that we are, you know, healthy and safe and not carrying anything that can be problematic for us. The stigma needs to go away, especially if we want to keep ourselves and our, you know, colleagues and friends and, you know, friends with benefits safe. Yeah, and it's funny because when you go to the doctor and you ask them to be screened, they always say like, well, why? Do you have a new partner? Do you have, and I'll be like, sir, if you don't put the, the orders in, like, <laughs> I'm not answering all that of that. Part. Like, I just want to be tested because it's really, it's so powerful to know. That does it for this episode of PBS Vitals. I know this show was heavy, but it doesn't have to be. Tell us what you think in the comments and hit us up on our socials. And please check out the show description. You'll find a lot of helpful links. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. See you next time and thanks for watching.